Welcome to Novelist Spotlight, the podcast where published fiction writers are interviewed to gather their insights and writing lessons so we can use them to make ourselves better and more effective writers. There are just three things I ask of you, if appropriate to you and your experience. Please subscribe, please click on the like button, and please share this program link with any family members, friends, or colleagues who might be interested or benefit from the content. Now, on with our program. This is Mike Consul. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the program. Always appreciate your listenership. We're going to talk a little bit about hotels, crime, books. I love hotels. I love staying in good hotels. I used to write a, bl a blog post, the, the blog page for a boutique hotel, a well-known boutique hotel here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And one of the things I learned in doing that, and one of the things people spend little time talking about or thinking about really, is that hotels have crime. Hotels attract, especially good hotels, attract people with money. And criminals like people with money. And savvy criminals know that uh, travelers are distracted. They're, they're having a good time. They're distracted. They're not looking around uh, maybe as uh, assiduously as they should. And, and next thing you know, something's missing. <laughs> um, so... And hotels are well aware of this. They've got so good hotels have security. Good hotels warn you about things. They don't call out your room numbers and, and such. At least they're not supposed to. Um, now, when I talk about crime, I'm talking about normally things like theft, not murder. But <laughs> that's not to say murder doesn't happen at hotels on occasion. A very high profile ones can happen at times. And that leads me to the people are in the spotlight today. Their names are Prudence Emery and Ron Bass, and they have collaborated on a book called Death at the Savoy, the Savoy Hotel in London. You've heard of it. Uh, someday I hope to stay there. Prudence Emery is the uh, former press secretary at the Savoy Hotel, so she speaks with great authority on this. She writes with great authority on it, and uh, she's also a publicist extraordinaire for scores of movies, she has had several careers to her credit and uh, has rubbed elbows with uh, Hollywood A-listers, politicians, and celebrities. And she's good friends with Ron Bass. Uh, Ron is a prolific author who has been writing a, a detective series called the Sanibel Sunset Detective Series. And uh, he's been writing those over the past 12 years. And he's written a host of other books as well outside of that series. So Prunes Emery has now teamed up with Ron Bass, her longtime friend to write this page-churning literary murder mystery, again titled Death at the Savoy, during which an international arms dealer is found, I'm not giving anything away here, but an international arms dealer is found dead in his room, and the protagonist, Priscilla Tempest, love that name, Priscilla Tempest, uh, herself a press secretary for the Savoy, um, is our protagonist. Uh, Ron and uh, Prudence, welcome to the program. Mike, it's a, it's a delight to be here. Thank you. Hello, hello from Prudence. <laughs> yeah, Ron, you're joining us from where, Florida? No, I'm in uh, outside of Toronto in Milton. I spend a, uh, we have a place in Florida in Fort Myers, and we're, uh, what, with COVID in the last little while, we haven't been down all that often. But uh, but no, I, I live uh, as just outside of, I, I'm, a, I'm a former Toronto boy. I was the uh, movie critic at the Toronto Star, the Canada's largest newspaper for many years. Toronto Star, well, along with Hemingway there. Exactly. Yes, yeah, so I, I came a few years after he did. <laughs> yeah, it's a good but, thing. <laughs> but but I, I had about the same attitude towards the newspaper as Hemingway did. So uh, Yeah, so I want to write longer stories, right? Stop editing my stories. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, that's where I am. And Prudence is way, way out west on Vancouver Island in Victoria. So um, thanks to modern technology, otherwise we could never have done this book, but thanks to uh, uh, modern technology, uh, we were able to collaborate together on it and rekindle a, a longtime friendship, which was even more fun than writing the book. Wow. So Prudence, were you, uh, now when you were at the Savoy, did a murder happen? Is that what inspired this story or is this uh, purely a product of the imagination? The murder is a totally fiction. Although there was a murder in 1923, but I can't discuss it because it involves something extremely rude. Oh, really? 
Well, that, <laughs> I, that this just the story began when Ron read my memoir, um, Nanaimo Girl, and he particularly liked the chapter on the Savoy, which began the chapter began death by champagne, and there were there are a lot of stories in there that, that turned him on and, and it, it inspired him to create the series Mar um, Priscilla Tempest and Death at the Savoy. And well, Philip, now what is the what is the, uh, the name of your memoir, Prudence? Nanaimo Girl. So, Nanaimo. so Prudence is, is, is from Nanaimo in British Columbia and this kid from Nanaimo w went around the world, including being the uh, 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 the head of the press office at the Savoy Hotel. And you've only got to read this book, Mike, to see what a glamorous life uh, uh, Prudence lived in those days. I mean, she knew everybody. She hobnobbed with Noel Coward and Louis Armstrong and uh, just uh, it, it, uh, knew everybody who was anybody coming through London in the late 60s. And I thought to myself, good. I knew Prudence had had... Um, that experience at the Savoy. I knew she'd worked there, but you know, it's like, you know, you know each other for years, you chit chat, you talk about everything, uh, but you don't talk about your past that much. And when I read the book, I was just dazzled by that. I'm dazzled by the whole book, but dazzled particularly by that section. And so I, I, I couldn't help but think, God, this would make a great uh, murder mystery. So uh, I, 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 Called Prudence. Is that up. where it started? Pardon so me? you called Prudence at that point? That's how it got started? Yeah. You called Prudence and said, let's do this? Yeah. Let's. I said, what do you think about writing a murder mystery? And she said, well, uh, I've never written a murder mystery. And I said, well, I've never uh, stayed at the Savoy, so we'll be a perfect combination. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me about the Savoy and I'll supply the body. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's pretty much what it came down to. Uh, that, uh, you know, she had all, all the uh, background at her fingertips. Uh, I had the Colonel Mustard in the library with the candlestick stuff. And uh, uh, together we uh, uh, embarked on writing the book. I'd like, I'd, like, I'd, Sorry, like, ahead, I'd like to say that Ron is a nuts and bolts and I'm a champagne and caviar. <laughs> that, that's perfect. You know, I'm looking at the, uh, you know, the table of contents and I want to just let our listeners know that uh, here's like chapter one is called The Body in Suite 705. Um, there's chapter two is welcome to the Savoy. And I'm going to ask, uh, for a tour of the Savoy, a little bit, of, a little bit of information on that from Prudence, but it also goes on to talk about, uh, I do believe there's the ink stained wretch, an inspector called Spanish caviar. There it is. Spanish caviar. There's mystery woman and, and so on. Um, what about welcome to the Savoy of uh, Prudence? You obviously, as Ron was saying, you, you rubbed elbows with uh, the rich and famous and infamous. And uh, uh, what talk about the Savoy a little bit. What kind of environment are readers going to be uh, basically uh, submerged into uh, when reading this book? What is the Savoy Hotel all about? Prudence, this may be a good opportunity to introduce uh, the reading I'd like to do, which I think will tell us about the Savoy. Well, that's, that's quite a good idea. It, first of all, if you were from Fleet Street, you'd come to my office, 205, and, and cage a drink off off the Savoy because they got they know they could get free drinks. So that was where we also <laughs> drank quite a lot of champagne. And if you entered the the main foyer, shall I tell you describe the hotel or shall I tell you a story about Peter Sellers' engagement to Liza Minnelli? How about both? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to tell you a Liza Minnelli story. Peter Sellers was dropping Liza Minnelli off in the Savoy forecourt, which is the main entrance off the Strand, and the red Mercedes Benz in the mornings around 8.30. So we all had a pretty good idea what they were up to. Then I get a phone call from Liza saying, I, I, I want to hold a press conference to announce my engagement to Peter Sellers. And I said, he knows that. She said, yes, he wrote it. I said, okay. And I, I reserved a River Street, all Fleet Street. It was absolutely jammed with, with television, cameras, journals with their note, notebooks. And she read the uh, announcement and left the room and that said no more. And, and uh, so she was walking down the hall. She was pursued by the journalist and her, her godmother, Dorothy Thompson, who wrote Eloise at the Waldorf. And we're now down on the main 
level heading towards the foyer and I'm at the front of the line saying no pictures in the foyer which was a strict rule at Savoy so you wouldn't be photographed with your mistress and, and Liza, <laughs> Liza and, and her godmother started dancing and singing no pictures in the foyer and, the, and they're pursued by a parade of, of journalists and down the hall in the opposite direction walks an old older man very slowly and you know who he is Charlie Chaplin <laughs> and only one journalist recognized him. Wow. Because he was not in his normal attire. <laughs> right. and oh, he has a mustache on. Huh? You know, <laughs> he probably had to be quite an old journalist to recognize him. So tell talk about the Savoy generally. Like, What are some of the features of the Savoy or some of the uh, maybe uh, marks of distinction or maybe the big events in its history? Just in brief. I'm just trying to think. There's so many, so many things. It was built by um, Richard Doyle Cart, who was empresario for Gilbert and Sullivan. You know Gilbert and Sullivan, the operators. And he built the Savoy Hotel in the late 1800s, and then he built the sorry, he built the Savoy Theater first, then the hotel. It was the first hotel to have electricity, to have elevators, and to have its own um, laundry, its own artesian well. And it sort of took off from there. Well, you know, the uh, Mike, one of the interesting things about the, the, the Savoy, uh, when it was first opened, it he insisted on having uh, bathrooms in each suite. And that was unheard of at, uh, in the uh, late 1800s. Nobody, everybody thought he was crazy to have a bathroom in the same suite that you wear. And... Uh, uh, it's innovations like that that, that uh, nobody had ever thought of. Uh, people coming out of their uh, well-to-do people uh, coming out of their homes to eat was unheard of. And uh, the Savoy in introduced, uh, 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 that they brought in um, uh, uh, Ritz and, and um uh, Prudence, help me with the... the Escoffier, the, Escoffier. Escoffier, yes, thank you. Uh, from uh, uh, France, French cooks. And uh, this was unheard of in London at the time. And for many, many years, uh, French was the uh, the language spoken in the kitchens. And, and only when Prue got there did uh, the Savoy actually have an English-speaking chef. Am I right, Prue? The first non-French chef, Trompetto. Yes. So it, it, uh, uh, an amazing history, and uh, 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 you know, just a, a revolutionary concept in hotels at the time. Now, by the time we set the novel in 1968, uh, the Savoy is very, very well established. It's an iconic hotel. Uh, it's in its glory days in 1968, and, and one of the the, the great thing of the things about setting the the novel there was the fact that it also takes place at, in, at the height of so-called swinging London, you know, where where the the the, the Beatles were in flower and uh, you know, uh, Carnaby Street and and all the sort of iconic things that were going on in London at the time uh, were, are swirling around the background uh, for these novels. So it, it, it's a great setting to have. Wow. So you're talking 200 rooms and uh, a room for the night these days would run you in the neighborhood of what, Prudence? God, good question. I, I think it's, it's well over, to stay at the Savoy today, it's well over a thousand, I believe, pounds a night to uh, stay there. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we have to sell a few more books, Mike. Anything you can do to help. <laughs> so... Ron, you, you, as I said, you are writing the Sanibel Sunset Detective Series. Is the thought that Death of the Savoy is going to be a series of some kind? And is is the setting, I think a hotel is a great setting because everybody converges at a hotel. There's so much going on at a modern hotel, especially one of this caliber. Are you thinking in terms of the future? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Books in this uh, we, at the Savoy, or is it going to move around? Well, certainly uh, for the time being, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, but for the we've finished the second book, Scandal at the Savoy, um, uh, and it, in fact, we're just finishing the editing of it now. So 
Uh, and we've started to work on the third book in the series, Princess of the Savoy. So uh, we're- oh, wow. So it is a Savoy series. So and... we're anticipating that this will be a series. Um, the, uh, the publisher uh, here in Canada uh, has bought the first two uh, books in the series. Uh, the um, uh, audio folks, Dreamscape, who have, have bought the first two books. And uh, uh, there's a, uh, a big French publisher, Martinique, Ha, has bought the first two books as well, so uh, uh, we're we're uh, signed up for at least two books, and and hopefully we will continue it because, uh, first of all, they're great fun to write. Uh, they take me completely out of myself, and uh, uh, and, uh, and w along with Prue, and uh, you, you know, I I grew up loving stuff like. Um, uh, uh, charade and uh, it takes a thief or to catch a thief. Mm -hmm. uh, right. th th these these glamorous the movies uncle. featuring glamorous stars and in in glamorous settings, and uh, the, the 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 Savoy novels are a chance to to to, to kind of relive a childhood when. You know, it's a fantasy. I mean, the, what what goes on in in uh, Death at the Savoy is, is a is a is a delightful, hopefully humorous fantasy. Uh, it's it's not the real Savoy, but but it's 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 fun conjuring up. Uh, 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 you know, it, it's glamorous in, incarnation. Yes, it's now, Death at the Savoy. To, to our listeners, Death of the Savoy is available now. I mean, it's it's available for pre-order. It's available right now. for pre-order. It's the American publication isn't uh, until October, but I believe you'll be able to get the audio book at the end of August. And as you say, you can certainly pre-order it now uh, at, uh, at Barnes and Noble or on Amazon.com, and uh, or at your local independent bookstore. Uh, they they will be delighted to uh, to pre-order the book for you. And then, you know, you can also uh, take a copy with you when you stay at the Savoy. Don't expect to find it at the gift shop because hotels are not in the business of uh, uh, selling books that talk about murder on their property. <laughs> so I don't think I don't think you'll find it uh, in the uh, uh, as a replacement for the King James Bible or anything like well, that. Well, it's like you hotel. won't find uh, movies about plane crashes on airlines either. So. Exactly. So, exactly. Uh, yes. I, I, and also, I, as you know, Ron, newspapers are told if if if. With, uh, you know, if they're running an advertisement, United Airlines or American or any airlines running an advertisement, and there's a plane crash that needs to be reported, pull our ad. We don't want our ad there. <laughs> Just don't run it. Don't run it that day, or maybe even that week, if it's going to be sustained well, coverage. I think like you're revealing disaster. your age a bit here, Mike. Uh, poor old newspapers anymore. I, I, I don't. When think we used get much... to get those, yeah, when we used to get those kind of ads, Ron. Yeah. Now it's like exactly, uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. exactly. I, That's I, I, definitely I, an age thing. That the romantic era of newspapering is is a thing of the past. Um, but we have all these new channels and technologies that we get to avail uh, ourselves of. But um, yeah, the, the glory days of newspapers, like the glory days of hotels. I don't know. I, are the glory days of hotels still here, Prudence? Or do you think they are? Because some, some of the uh, grand ladies of hoteling, uh, like the Savoy, are still around. But as the hoteling become just kind of a business where it's like build it, fill rooms, make a profit. I think for for a lot of, a lot of travelers who can't afford the Savoy or Claridge's or the Connaught or the Barclay, all of which are owned by the Savoy, so I, there would be a lot of shoebox hotels. I would call them. Mm -hmm. Which would which, which, which one? I, I have a uh, Mike. I've got a very good friend uh, who's a uh, was a well known hotelier in Toronto. And he thinks that the the the, uh, the the day of the great hotel is is past. And uh, uh, you know, I when I was a, a young reporter coming out to Los Angeles all the time, I they used to put me up at the Beverly Wilshire, and that was a wonderful, romantic, glamorous old hotel. And uh, they've now, uh, the last time I was in Los Angeles, they had refurbished it. Uh, there are Japanese owners. Who have owned lots of other hotels, and it looks like, uh, you know, it, it looks like a, a marbleized version of every other hotel, uh, every other high-end hotel. Um, I'm not so sure that the same thing hasn't happened to the Savoy in London as well. It's undergone uh, a multi-million-dollar uh, refurbishment, 
And, uh, you know, the, these things tend to take away the old time glamour of these hotels. Uh, yeah. And specific yeah. tables where people sat on the grill. There were two restaurants in the Savoy, the grill, but you come into the foyer on the left. And it has a separate chef, and then there's a restaurant which serves sometimes 2,000 meals a day. And there were tables where Churchill sat, or no Coward sat, or there's t chairs, t tables in the corner of the room where nobody sat. If you were rele relegated to those, it was a, an embarrassment because you were se seated at a not a chic table. So that goes with the sort of snobism that goes with that, that kind of hotel as well. Uh, let's do this. Ron, let's have you read that section about the Savoy. And then after that, I want the two of you to talk about how you collaborated, what the process was, because it's not easy for two people to work on a book. In fact, a lot of times, one of the attractions to writing is it's a solitary process. You have complete control over, you don't have anybody else sitting on your shoulder, chirping in your ear, and so on. It's not easy to, to work in tandem, but uh, you two obviously have a winning formula there. But why don't we start with you reading sure. a little bit about yeah, be and, and set uh, it up? The, yeah, set it up for us, Ron. What, what section of the book is this? So we're uh, uh, chapter two, it's Welcome to the Savoy. And this kind of sets up our. Uh, uh, our uh, arrival at the Savoy uh, for uh, for readers. So, it, as I say, chapter two, welcome to the Savoy. The Savoy. The very name could leave one breathless with anticipation. After all, that name had come to denote the luxury and fine service available only to a certain kind of very special guest, a guest who understood the best and therefore demanded it. A guest, in short, who had lots and lots of money. The Savoy prided itself on delivering the very best to those very rich and very well connected 24 hours a day. Knowing of the Savoy's impeccable reputation, even the most jaded of guests could not arrive in its rarefied world without a certain amount of awe. After all, here was the Savoy. And here you were, a part of it, if only for a brief period of time. The Savoy said you were not like everyone else, and thus you were not. One entered via the Strand Courtyard, haughtily inspected by the statue of Count Peter of Savoy atop the stainless steel Art Deco canopy. The Count was given the land the hotel stood on by King Henry III in the mid-13th century. Now, having received Count Peter's blessing, there would be a friendly nod from the head doorman who recognized immediately the kind of guest you were, deserving the best, remember? The doorman ushered you through the revolving doors of the front entrance, passing the porters in dove gray suits poised to help with your voluminous Louis Vuitton luggage. Once through the doors, one arrived in the lobby, known as the front hall, admiring the mixture of Edwardian Art Deco stylings, mahogany woodwork, reflecting from polished black and white checkerboard marble floor tiles. Opposite the main entrance, the wide staircase led to the restaurant overlooking the embankment. Now, if one was more than simply a special guest of the Savoy, if one had been anointed a god or goddess of popular culture, a celebrity, as those gods and goddesses were known, then one would wish to be introduced to the Savoy press office. To access the press office, a climb of three steps was necessary, and then a, a brief walk along the corridor past the theater ticket desk to the left and the hair salon to the right to room 205, known simply as 205. A second lift was opposite the door. Once inside 205, a visiting celebrity, or heaven forbid, a member of the press in search of a free drink, would be confronted by two offices of blonde wood paneling with a wall devoted to autographed photographs of other gods and goddesses who over the years had blessed the Savoy with their presence. In one of those offices, you would find the hotel's young, and some would say too young, press officer, Miss Priscilla Tempest. Ah, yes, Miss Tempest. Well, she doesn't quite fit in, does she? But then this was the press office, so not a great deal was expected. You had only to catch a glimpse of her as she hurried through the front hall to see that she was, well, different. She had fashionably short reddish blonde hair, a fashionably pixie-like face that most men found irresistible, and fashionably long legs she liked to display in a series of 
fashionable miniskirts. It should be said that men usually found her legs even more irresistible, fashionably speaking. And that's the introduction to the Savoy and to our, our heroine, our unlikely heroine, our plucky heroine, uh, Pr uh, Priscilla Tempest. Sometimes, well, Ronnie, proved. I hope you're gonna, I hope you're going to read the audio edition of the book because you definitely bring some dramatic flair to it. Oh well, thank you. Uh, uh, we have a, a, a wonderful uh, reader, uh, a, a woman named Eunice Wong, is doing the reading, uh, and she's a, a veteran of this sort of thing, and, and she. Uh, she brings a lot of flair to it as well. Nice. And it should be read by a woman because your protagonist is a woman. Exactly. So. Exactly. I think that uh, was a very good decision on, on the part of Dreamscape. Well, I mean, Talk about... Oh, go ahead, Bruce. Well, I just wanted to compliment Rod on his reading as well. That was really good. I'm oh, impressed. yes. Well, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Far beyond what, what I usually get when I ask somebody to do a little bit of reading. Yeah. Well, um, well, it's, it's a fun section to read and, and it's a fun book. Uh, uh, you know, we... we uh, Prudence and I had a great deal of time uh, uh, putting together the humor. There's a lot of humor in the book. And, and again, a throwback to the kind of, you know, Stanley Donan uh, movies of, uh, like, like Charade and, and uh, Hitchcock and, and that sort of thing that, that uh, no matter how much suspense there was, there was always some humor thrown in as well. And we've tried to do that with the book. Now, we wanted to talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the process that uh, Prudence and I went through to yeah. collaborate. Writing in tandem is not easy. So what uh, you called her, said, hey, why don't we do this? She said, I'm on board. So then what did you do from there? Well, as an example of, of the uh, kind of collaboration we had, uh, Prudence came up with the name Priscilla. I came up with the name Tempest. And, and it kind of went like that. <laughs> what do you and think? I want to, let me stop you for just one second, because that's one of the other things I wanted to discuss with you. I think it's a great name, and one of the mistakes I think authors often make is they don't put enough thought into na in naming their characters. They don't they don't give the names enough panache, or I mean, even Stephen King, one of his main characters was Johnny Smith. I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean, what about what, when you approach naming? And this is really a Ron question, but probably more than a Prudence question. Although now you you become a a, a writer as well, Prudence. Uh, and I guess you did write because you were in the press office. But um, the uh, what what do you take into consideration when you're trying to name a character? Well, I think exactly that, uh, Mike. That uh, uh, in, in the, um, the the name of my uh, Sanibel Sunset detective uh, detective, he's Tree Callister, and uh, I if I've been asked that uh, in, when I'm doing book signings in Florida, if I've been asked that once, I've been asked it a hundred times. How did you come up with the name of Tree? And uh, and as I often do when I'm I'm looking at the credits uh, as they roll off at the end of uh, various movies, and I always look at the credits because often I know people. And uh, secondly, it's a good source to uh, to, to find names. So um, that's funny. I do the same thing. Yeah, that's funny. Oh, do you? Oh, there's great. a lot. Of, there's a lot of great names. Exactly. There's a lot of great names you find. So somebody was named one of the credits. Somebody was named Tree, and I thought, ah, that, that's a great name. And then then Callister came up with uh, my, uh, my my cousin's married name was Callister, and I always liked that name. So Tree Callister was born. And in the case of Priscilla, uh, Prudence, you came up with Priscilla. What made you think of Priscilla? Pure creativity. <laughs> well, we couldn't call her Prudence. <laughs> yes. Ron well, sometimes yeah. made a mistake in writing and had Prudence instead of Priscilla in some of the paragraphs. So on, on, no the, cover of, of uh, on the cover of Nanaimo Girl, there is a wonderful uh, photograph of uh, Prudence when she was at the Savoy. And I guess they took it, uh, the, the, the photograph was taken on the roof of the Savoy uh, showing uh, Prudence's lovely legs. And uh, that <laughs> image uh, stuck with me all through the writing of, of the first novel and the second one as well. So uh, so I once in a while, I, I, I'm guilty of slipping from, Pruden from Priscilla to Prudence. <laughs> but, uh, and Tempest, I think again, I saw somebody, somebody's last name um, uh, or uh, a char another character was named Tempest. But I, as soon as I saw Tempest, I thought, aha, there's, there's, uh, there's a name for 
uh, a uh, uh, a heroine who sometimes doesn't act quite like a heroine, but uh, uh, manages to get through to the end uh, almost despite despite herself. So that was a starting point there. You came up with the name of the protagonist. Talk about the process from there as well. Prudence? Ron. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, as, as you mentioned earlier, I've written a lot of books and I, I, I worked in journalism for many years and uh, I've, I've always been a lone wolf. Uh, I didn't even like to you know, as many, many, many journalists do, you don't even like to, you know, as, as uh, uh, Groucho Marx once said, uh, I, I, I don't want to belong to any club that would have me as a member. And, and I've, <laughs> I've always, I've always ad adhered to that, that uh, philosophy. So it never crossed my mind uh, to collaborate with anyone on, on a book, although I've got a couple of friends who, who write nonfiction together here in Canada. And they get along quite well, but uh, I never really thought of it seriously until, uh, as, as again, as I say, I, I read *Nanaimo Girl*. So, um, and and I, I, uh, Prudence and I have always gotten along like a house on fire. We've always, you know, we we uh, uh, when Prudence was a uh, publicist, uh, we. We didn't quite travel the world together, but we sure ended up in a lot of crazy locations together, including in, in Israel, in a snowbank in Barkerville, British Columbia, uh, getting drunk with Oliver Reed in Montreal. Uh, we, you know, we, we we've heard the chimes at midnight uh, uh, many times over the years, Prudence and I. So, so we were good friends. Uh, we were good friends, and it was a chance for us. And I thought, well, if nothing else. Uh, I don't even know whether we can find a publisher for this, but if nothing else, uh, it'll give us a chance to rekindle our friendship and work together on something. And who knows what it's going to turn out to be? Well, it turned out to be a delight. Uh, uh, we, we talked all the time on the phone. I would write some pages. She would uh, and send them out to her, and which we're just in the process of doing in, in the third book, in fact, and uh, send them out to her. And she would... Uh, uh, mark them up, change things, add, uh, uh, fix my mistakes. Uh, when I had somebody going left at the, in the front hall at the Savoy, instead of going right, she was there to, to fix that up. And uh, uh, we went just went back and, and, and forth like that. And Prudence came up with the uh, initial plot uh, when, uh, to get us started. And we just, we just took it from there. And we had a delightful time. And, and every once in a while, as we talked on the phone and recounted former uh, adventures and people we knew over the years and this sort of thing, and every once in a while, we'd also talk about the book. So, so <laughs> it, it, it turned out to be great fun, and it continues to be great fun. So you've moved on to book two and three, really. Um, by the way, to our listeners, uh, Nanaimo Girl uh, is in the episode. I'm, I'm putting it in the episode notes. So you can click over and get uh, your hands on Prudence Emery's memoir. I'm also going to have a link to Ron Bass's website so you can see all of his work. Oh, thank you. Great. Um, That's so, fantastic. Uh, thank you. So yeah, uh, Prudence's memoir is, is an absolute delight. And uh, as when I finished it, I mean, again, she worked with just about everybody under the sun. Uh, uh, and, uh, but as, as I finished the book, uh, uh, I came to the conclusion that, that uh, Prudence was a lot more fun than most of the movies she she uh, covered. <laughs> you know, I, I said earlier that a hotel, I consider a hotel just a great venue for storytelling um, and, and for a novel for what you guys are doing. And, and I see, you know, you're, you're really basing this series at the Savoy. I can see that there's so many different directions you can go with this one venue and this one type of business. Uh, talk a little bit about what you feel like a hotel, especially a hotel of that note, offers a storyteller. Prudence? Um, well, first of all, the press officer, and then the caliber of the people who come and stay there, and, and the many adventures that one encounters in one's job. I'm not quite sure how. What, yeah, I, I, well, the, the other thing that we've done in the books, and I've had great fun doing it, and we've 
uh, pulled on our knowledge of the various celebrities we've both met over the years is using real people. You know, Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor show mm -hmm. up in the book. Princess Margaret shows up. Uh, uh, Noel Coward shows up. Um, in, in, in the second book, uh, uh, Prudence is aided in the mystery she's trying to solve by the, the go by the members of the Gossip's Bridal Club. Just and, the member, and the members of the of the club in the second book are Laurence Olivier, John Gilgood, and Noel Coward. Well, the, of course, they never, uh, uh, there was no Gossip's Bridal Club, and uh, they were uh, not particularly, they knew each other over the years, but they were not particularly close. But in, in the wonderful fictional world of the Savoy, you can do these things. And you can, and as they say, you can use uh, real personalities. And I, and I find that uh, just a delight. It just adds a, a little something to it. And you can only do that in an iconic hotel like the Savoy, you know, the, uh, uh, the uh, Holiday Inn in downtown Topeka, Kansas, you, you're not going to be able to do that. But at the Savoy Hotel, ah, all bets are off. So royalty gets into trouble at the Savoy. Uh, famous uh, movie stars get into trouble at the Savoy. Anything can happen at the Savoy, at least in, yeah, in, in, yeah. in, in, uh, in our Savoy. So Yeah, I, the, well, the possibilities are endless. And you know, t tell me, Prudence, you were press secretary. Most hotels do not have a press secretary. What did you do as press secretary? Well, as I mentioned before, gave a lot of free drinks to the guys in fleece. <laughs> well, tell <laughs> that, them about that's you. a way to get the reporters to show up. Well, well, tell, <laughs> tell them about the waiter button, Prudence. Oh, I will. So I had at uh, my office, and I had a staff of four, sort of frightfully okay English debutantes. And I had on my desk a, a plaque that said, waiter, with three buttons, waiter, maid, valet. And the, the, the waiter button got pushed a lot because he's the one who brought the drinks. And we also sent out a weekly um, celebrity bulletin to, to media outlets, who was coming, who was at the Savoy and who was leaving. And that got us a lot of, and then we helped people with, their, as I mentioned, with their press conferences. And generally just being, hospitable really well, well you and, know uh, uh but the thing is that today uh you know famous hotels tend to look for privacy for their guests they don't want to say hey fatty arbuckle is going to come to town or or uh you're going to be staying at the hotel or obviously in modern day we're going to have elon musk here or we're going to have um you know uh brad pitt um so that in in that way things have changed a lot correct i mean there's no press officer or secretary at the Savoy anymore, I would imagine, at least not doing the same things you were doing, Prudence, or is there? Well, also, we, we knew who would, who wanted the publicity and who didn't. For instance, Moshe Diane once stayed at the Savoy, and we had to lie through our teeth saying he wasn't there, and the journalists knew it, but we just played the game, you know? So, oh, so if Paris uh, Hilton so came, you you would definitely, she would definitely want you to let everybody know, or if Kim Kardashian came along, she would definitely want you to put the word oh, out. Would absolutely. So that's... But, but but you hit on a good thing, uh, an interesting point, uh, uh, Mike. It was a much different world back then uh, uh, than it is now. And, uh, um, you know, when Bob Hope came to the hotel, as he does in the novel, um, you know, he wanted attention, right, Drew? Mm -hmm. Well, definitely. He had, he had his own PR. I liaised with her, Lady Carolyn Townsend was her name. Yeah, so it it was uh, 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 as as I say a, a different world, and even when Prudence was doing uh, 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 publicity for uh, uh, movie shoots, I mean the uh, the idea of flying journalists into anywhere these days, I, I think, has gone the way of the dodo. I mean, it's just it's it's just the economics are such that they just don't do it anymore, and nobody's particularly interested in. Uh, getting a uh, uh, copy in a, in a newspaper anyway. So so it, it's it's just a much different world. And one, one of the great things about, again, setting the, the novel in, in, the, in the late 60s was that uh, you don't have to worry about cell phones. You don't have to worry about the internet. You, you don't have to worry about CCTV cameras everywhere. If, if, if you watch a British mystery that's set in, in, in contemporary London, uh, they are highly reliant 
on CCTV cameras and, and looking at CCTV footage. Uh, well, we don't have to worry about that. In the, and if you know, if, if Pris- Priscilla has to make a phone call, she's got to find a, a call box somewhere. <laughs> so it, 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 it's a much, it was a much simpler world. Yes, yes, absolutely. So um, the there have been some famous. There was actually a uh, Alex Haley. Was Alex the guy Haley. Who wrote a, Arthur Haley. Hotel. Sorry, uh, Arthur Haley. Arthur Haley. Yeah, Alex he Haley did book. Roots. Arthur Haley, who, who was right. a Canadian novelist, incidentally, uh, wrote Hotel. Oh. And and that was a big hit. Yes. Huge. And but there there's there, how many? I mean, there's not really that many novels that have been set. I mean, they always. It's almost as if hotels are characters in you know innumerable novels because you know there's meetings there. There's uh, or our key to the suite is uh, my my favorite John D. McDonald book, which is not about Travis McGee. A, a wonderful book about uh, you know uh, basically a convention at a yes, at a nameless. Yeah. I think it was a nameless hotel. Yes, and in, um, in that case, well, and one of the, of course one of the most famous. Uh, uh, novels of all time, and one of the most famous movies is Grand Hotel, the the Vicky the Vicky Baum uh, novel, and mm. that uh, and uh, uh, the uh, movie was turned into, and it still holds up very well today. In fact, I I use I use the Grand Hotel as a plot point in in the the second novel, Scandal at the Savoy, but it, it's a movie that still holds up very well today, and that was sort of the uh, the uh, 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 the example that uh, so many people have used since then uh, to write novels about uh, the, uh, 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 about uh, you know grand hotel literally grand hotels um, you know a cast of characters comes into the hotel they intermingle with one another some live some die some love some don't you know it's 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 that that, that mixture that goes on in 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 as as I say a grand hotel and that's been used yeah. as a template many many times over the years including uh, uh, very famously by by Arthur Haley and uh, you know just by the by you know when we started out to do this it's amazing what you think and what you are then uh, brought up short <laughs> by when I we first started out to uh, I thought oh this is such a a unique idea. Uh, you know, uh, nobody's ever done anything like this before. And uh, I soon found out that w- w- the reason why we had to uh, call the book Death at the Savoy, because it turned out somebody was writing, a no- it was just publishing a novel in England called Murder at the Savoy. And it turns out there are several murder uh, murders at the Savoy over the years. And it uh, it, it, it turns out we are not the only ones to come across the idea, as we've just discussed. We are not the only ones to set a mystery at a hotel. Shock, horror. <laughs> well, uh, or the Savoy. Um, or, yes, you have much, the say, we, we had to change the title because somebody else had beaten us to murder at the Savoy. And there's a night. Well, I got to chat, but you you've got the press secretary. You have the insider, well, the ultimate insider. Well, exactly. We've we, we've uh, Priscilla was on the ground, or Pr- Prudence was on the ground, uh, uh, soaking up the atmosphere and the information. So, uh, so Priscilla is actually kind of like your alter ego, there, Prudence. Um, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe, maybe that's an overstatement. You said. You, but the uh, the other thing I wanted to know is just did this get immediate interest? It sounds like the kind of you know you're talking about rich and famous. You're talking about this grand setting and all that, uh, and the possibilities there. And Ron, you have a long history as a as a uh, successful author. So I was I'm curious as to whether there was immediate interest in it from publishing companies. Well, the, there there was interest. Interestingly enough, part of the thing we ran into, uh, although this has served the book very, very well since its publication, um, what we ran into, and again, I was somewhat surprised by, uh, uh, by, or was somewhat surprised, but it wasn't dark enough. And it was never intended to be dark. The, as you know, as we said earlier, uh, the, the idea was to do this light, bubbly, humorous, uh, uh, mystery, you know, uh, full of uh, charming but uh, corrupt people and, and uh, uh, glamorous settings and, and all the things that we've ended up doing. 
But it was, you know, uh, uh, to my uh, somewhat surprise, although I should never be surprised by anything, by any reaction a publisher has to uh, <laughs> a, a, a novel that you bring to them. Um, That's right. It, you, I, I, I'm, I'm always uh, absolutely uh, gobsmacked by <laughs> the uh, 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 original reasons publishers can come up with not to publish your novel. And uh, so that turned that came out that came along a couple of times uh, that it, it wasn't dark enough. And uh, uh, it, what I had not thought of was uh, uh, some people thought it was a cozy mystery. And uh, uh, although we certainly bow a little bit to Agatha Christie, the, the queen of cozy mysteries, I suppose, I had never thought of it as a cozy mystery. So we've been advertising it as a, a not so cozy mystery. Uh, so did they did you end up making it darker based on they, they said they wanted darker and you did some revision to it? No, no. Uh, we found a publisher who liked it the way it was. Uh, OK, good. Uh, tell, them what, tell them about their publisher's weekly review. Well, uh, I, yes, it's got a great review in the publisher's weekly uh, who likes it precisely. And but most people have liked what uh, what we were trying to sell in the first place. Since it's been published, uh, uh, Martinique, uh, uh, a, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, 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 the French, a uh, uh, huge uh, French publisher, uh, they snapped up the, uh, the, the first two books, loving exactly what it is, you know, the, the, the humor, the sophistication, uh, the, the, the setting of the novels. Uh, so, and the most of the reviews that we've gotten have have liked the things that we set out to do with the book. So, um, uh, and, and you know, as a, a, an agent in, in Los Angeles, in fact, told me many years ago, Ron, only one person, only one person can buy this book. So, uh, so you just have to find that person, and we did uh, with. Uh, uh, very, this very good Canadian publisher, Douglas and McIntyre, uh, who have been uh, uh, much to my, uh, I don't know what I was anticipating with the Douglas and McIntyre or, or, uh, or a, a traditional publisher again, but uh, they've turned out to be marvelous. And, and so uh, so, men so mentioned that we sold the film rights before the book was even published. Yes. Oh, you did? You sold the film rights already? Yes. Well, wow. thanks, again, thanks to Prudence. So Prudence uh, worked for years with uh, uh, over several films with Sophia Loren, and they became quite good friends. And um, so when we were out hunting for blurbs, uh, people who would say, you know, it's a work of art, uh, uh, two geniuses produced this novel, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, we uh, thought, well, uh, Prudence thought, well, let's send it to Sophia Loren. And no, maybe no, no. That's, that's not a true story. You you suggested that we send it to Sophia. All right. So I make, suggested we send make, it. I make an endorsement. I said, there's no way Sophia's going to endorse this book. You said, send it anyway. So I sent it to her son, Eduardo Ponte, who's married to an actress, a director, producer called Sasha Alexander. And she read it and phoned me and said, asked if she could option it. Just that's how it happened. Now, is she uh, the right stock to play Priscilla Tempest, perhaps? She no, said she's an actress. No, she's not. But, but no, she's, okay. she's, uh, she's not in her 20s. She's a lovely looking woman, but she's not not quite in her 20s that. anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. uh, but but uh, so the, the Ponty Company has uh, uh, has optioned uh, the, the first book. And, and, and as... as uh, uh, Prudence says Eduardo is the, the son, not just of Sophia Loren, but of Carlo Ponti, who in his heyday was one of the great uh, uh, producers. In, in, you know, he produced Dr. Zhivago and uh, 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 Blow Up, all, all sorts of uh, iconic films in, in the uh, 60s and 70s. So to have his son and and uh, Sasha Alexander involved in this is is uh, is wonderful. And again, just sort of you know, as uh, if when I was a kid, you know, I used to think, oh God, wouldn't it be great if Carlo Ponti wanted to make a movie out of what what you had just written? And uh, well, we never got quite got Carlo, but we got uh, Eduardo. So so close enough. <laughs> Good deal. Now I would imagine it's going to sell well. I mean, the book, the novel, will probably sell well in London and England. 
again, do you have again do you have, in, in in the name of uh, uh, or in, in in line with what we've been saying earlier, Mike. Uh, you you always live to be surprised. Uh, we may still find a British publisher for it, um, uh, but so far we haven't. Uh, I suspect, but it, it could still be sold and promoted there. Oh yes, I uh, think I think it'll it'll be distributed distributed there. And as I say, the French have uh, uh, the rights to it in, in France. So I don't know whether that that it will, will extend to the rest of Europe or not. But uh, but yeah, it's interesting. I, I think the British are very. Uh, it, it, you know, it's a, you know, as you probably know yourself, there it's a very tough market. Uh, they mm -hmm. are, uh, uh, you know, the, the couple of interlopers with a novel set at the Savoy. You know, I can well imagine what the thinking is. Well, who who do they <laughs> think they are? Kind of thing. So. Right, right. They're not. Uh, they don't even have accents. What are they talking well, about? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, you know, an agent, our agent has been handling all of that, but I can well imagine that that might be some of the thinking. So, but who knows? We so again, the, the, the sequel to this is called what at the, a scandal, at, scandal the at the Savoy. And then your third one is in that one's in editing and final editing. The third one editing, is, in, in, is, is in final editing. Uh, and the, the third one, we're just uh, in, in the first uh, twenty-five or 30,000 words of, of uh, writing it. Do you have a title for the third one? Princess of the Savoy. That's right. Princess <laughs> of the Savoy. Exactly. Um, nice, nice. So, uh, well, listen, congratulations to the both of you. This sounds like a great series. And and just the, the, the event, like I was saying, the venue, the, the possibilities are just endless because, I mean, in this case, it's an arms dealer who who meets uh, his demise, but you've got st statesmen, presidents, celebrities. Uh, Don't forget the royal it. family. The royal family. <laughs> the royal family. I mean, it's it's again the the yeah it's it's endless. So congratulations on uh, th in getting the uh, option as a movie as well. That's. Uh, uh, every author's dream to expand out into those other channels. So, I, 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 as I caution everybody, uh, you know, it's uh, it's great that they have optioned it. Uh, as I as I've said a million times, it's if uh, enthusiasm for can get a movie or a TV series made, uh, Sasha and Eduardo certainly have that enthusiasm. So we will see. But it, as you probably know, is uh, that. Uh, uh, many, 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 many of these things are optioned and, and uh, uh, yes, never go. Yeah, anywhere. in fact, we'll I, see. I had a good, I had a good friend who's no longer with us, but uh, who uh, screenwriter and uh, and had a couple of movies made, but but you know most of what he wrote was optioned, but never made. It's it's incredibly difficult to get something actually made, but um, you know with that kind of uh, grandeur, <laughs> you guys just might pull it off. So exactly. Uh, I, I've been involved in movies I never thought would get made in a million years that got made. I've got I've been involved in films uh, uh, that uh, I thought, gee, we've got just a, a fantastic directors. Everybody loves the script. How can this not get made? Well, guess what? <laughs> it never, they never yeah, got made. Yeah, they find a way not to make it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's, uh, um, so in the spotlight, again, has been Prudence Emery and Ron Bass, are co-authors of Death at the Savoy and uh, forthcoming Scandal at the Savoy and Princess of the Savoy and uh, available Death at the Savoy already available for pre-order. If you look in the episode notes, you can also uh, find a link to Prudence Emery's memoir and a link to Ron Bass's website where his a whole proliferation of books are available there. Ron has been writing for some time and been very productive at it. Uh, to Prudence, Ron, thank you very much for taking the time and uh, and taking us on this ride. Well, thank you, Mike. It was a, a real pleasure. It's 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 nice to be able to just to sit and chat for an hour or so about books and writing and uh, and, and adventures at the Savoy. So thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you indeed very much. Wonderful.